My mom used to cast spells on people she was mad at. She called them Italian curses, but I don't know what was so Italian about them. Even though she grew up with real Italian parents, my mom never even knew about the curses until she read an article about them in Reader's Digest. <laughs> she told me about the curses one night as we wrestled with a potato ricer to make a batch of gnocchi. But mom, I said, I thought God wanted us to love all people, even if they're mean to us. Oh, of course he does, sweetie. You probably won't ever have to invoke the curse. But if you ever have a real emergency, well, here's what you do. <laughs> it was a two-step process. One, conjure up as much bad energy as you can and focus it on your enemy. Be deliberate and specific. Envision your enemy getting hit by a semi-truck, torn to shreds by a grizzly bear, or stabbed in the heart by the night stalker. Kind of a reverse meta meditation. <laughs> Step two was legit, though. My mom showed me the gesture only once and said it was OK that she was demonstrating it because step one hadn't been done. She formed a V with her fingers to make the shape of a horn and then thrust her arm forward like a gladiator piercing a tiger's neck with its sword. <laughs> I lay in bed for a long time that night, clutching my Cabbage Patch Kid while my little brain tried to make sense of how God worked. Huh. The priest at church told us not to wish harm upon anyone. Isn't that what that peace be with you and also with you thing is all about? But my picture Bible at school has a story about that John the Baptist guy who got beheaded. And just now, my mom did that scary V thing with her hand. <laughs> so maybe it's OK to bypass God altogether when you really need to. Around the time my mom was passing down important spiritual guidance, she decided to go back to work. Us kids were all safe and sound at elementary school. Plus, we needed extra money. So my Aunt Karen, a nurse, suggested my mom take a receptionist job in the cardiologist's office where she worked and where she was also engaged to the doctor. <laughs> aunt Karen took the crazy aunt thing to a whole new level. She was always married to a different guy every time I saw her. One time I went to lunch with my mom and Aunt Karen, and somehow we ended up squeezed into one dressing room at Mervyn's so she could try on bras. <laughs> I had never seen fake boobs before, and I could not take my eyes off of them. <laughs> I know all ants are supposed to have good boobs, but their fullness, their tautness, and most of all, their sheen was irresistible to look at. <laughs> like two balloons on the verge of popping. It felt illicit and made me wonder how many more years I'd have to wait to get my own pair of fake boobs. <laughs> Aunt Karen's marriage to the cardiologist Nathan was a front page scandal because she was Catholic and he was Jewish. Ooh, that's really bad, my mom said, offering no further explanation. <laughs> we had grown up Catholic but attended a Methodist preschool, Lutheran daycare, and Baptist summer camp because the schedules just worked out. <laughs> we went to a Christian elementary school because my mom said the strict discipline of Catholic school had turned her into a super horny teenager. <laughs> she didn't want us turning out that way. Still, my mom said Catholics were probably the only ones who got to go to heaven. My mom made us call him Uncle Nathan, which was hard to remember because we had just gotten used to an Uncle Bill. <laughs> to me, they weren't different people, just variations of the same person. One of Aunt Karen's husbands, like Beta Fish. <laughs> we went to Uncle Nathan's house all the time because he had a swimming pool. But I didn't like him because he had big pepperoni nipples and puffy red lips. <laughs> And he kept turtles as pets. <laughs> I would complain to my mom in the car every time we had to go to his house. Ew, I don't want to hug him. He looks like a guy from the Bible. <laughs> Plus, I didn't want to come into contact with those nipples. No way. <laughs> After my mom's first week on the job, we realized Uncle Nathan didn't just look like an asshole. He was an asshole. <laughs> 
He used to yell at my mom so hard in front of her coworkers and even patients that she had to run outside and sob in her Dodge minivan. She gained weight. Nathan told her she was fat and that she wouldn't live to see her kids get married if she kept gaining weight. She had to take Ativan every day. I could hear her crying in her room in the morning when she was putting on her nylons, a process that seemed far more time consuming than it should have been. I would peek into her room without her knowing and see her clutching the Italian horn necklace dangling from her neck, the one she wore to ward off evil spirits, the one she wore above her crucifix necklace. My heart broke for my mom when I saw her like this, half naked, vulnerable, struggling with the pantyhose, going to a job she hated where the curly haired man with the big nipples would scream at her for making the <laughs> coffee too hot. She wanted to quit, but without a college education or any desirable job skills, she was stuck. She lasted six months. By then, her Ativan prescription had run out, and along with it, her ability to tolerate a daily living hell. So she rage quit, just grabbed her purse one day and walked out. The next day, she locked herself in her room. She didn't come out to watch me do backflips into the swimming pool. She didn't come out to eat her bullshit frozen lunch from Weight Watchers. She emerged only to watch Saturday Night Live, but didn't ask us to go get midnight donuts in the pat voice like she normally did. She was quiet, but looked decidedly resolute. I had never seen that look on her face. And even though I couldn't interpret it, I knew it meant something. At 5 a.m. the next morning, we got a call from Aunt Karen. After performing a late night emergency surgery at the local hospital, Uncle Nathan had wrapped his pea soup green Mercedes around a eucalyptus tree. He had broken his neck and lost consciousness. A pulmonologist who happened to be on the same road at the same time saw the accident, pulled over, and saved Uncle Nathan's life. I had never seen my mom more inconsolable than she was that day. She even brought out her special rosary beads that had been blessed by the Pope. She went to confession at our church, which she hadn't set foot in in five years because she didn't like the priest. We couldn't understand why she was so upset. She hated Nathan. He had come back to life, so what was the big deal? It wasn't until a few years later after my mom had been diagnosed with cancer, that she told me to never put an Italian curse on anyone, not even in emergencies. <laughs> Remember Uncle Nathan, she said? She told me I was instead to turn to God, and God only when I needed something. Or maybe Jesus, who knows? I could never understand which one I was supposed to pray at. <laughs> but now that shit had hit the fan, God was there to protect us. And well, to judge us too, but mostly he was there to protect us, <laughs> except when he wasn't because he had let her get this cancer, but he was gonna save her too. <laughs> Catholicism was definitely back on the table, especially the parts that included angels. Angel figurines and paintings appeared daily from friends and family. Tall Mexican angel candles were lit each night in my mom's bathroom. We even attended a special angel healing mass at the local Catholic church, a place people could go for miracles. As we walked out of the church that night, my mom told me, I'm going to live another 10 years. I'll be here to see you graduate from college. I'll hold your babies. I know it now. But even though she wore tiny gold angel stud earrings every day and attended special masses, she got sicker the kind of sick that swallows hope. I began praying for the first time in my life, to whom or to what I did not know, nor did I care. I thought if I prayed harder and longer, begging and pleading with God or Jesus, that he would let her live. All of our neighbors were driving around in cars with bumper stickers that advertised a Jesus Coachella called the Harvest Festival. <laughs> We clung to the Harvest Festival for dear life. If we could just get my mom there, prop her up among the prayers and the amens and the hallelujahs, she would live. The chemo wasn't working, surgery had failed, radiation had failed. The Harvest Festival was our last hope. 
But when we pushed my mom's wheelchair to our seats in the stadium and stood there expectantly, like bow your head and pray, God damn it, she sat still, took one look at that massive, drunk on Jesus crowd swaying to the beat of Christian rock and said, I want to go home. She was done, not just with Harvest Festival, but with life. I could see it in her face and feel it in my bones. She asked us to stop on the way home for margaritas at her favorite Mexican restaurant. I was furious with her. I pushed the bean and cheese burrito around on my plate with my fork and asked her why she made us leave the Harvest Festival. She said, fuck that shit. <laughs> I never hated her more than I did at that moment. And I never loved her more than I do now. Now that I understand, she had finally figured out that peace came not from Italian witchcraft, not from a Catholic God or a Christian Jesus or an angel, but from her own heart. That is the spiritually flexible Jennifer Stiff, everybody.